My name is Daniel Evans. Um, I'm very thankful to be here this morning at uh, such an honorable event. I'd like to thank, of course, my colleague, uh, Mr. Kitu Bindra, for bringing my, to my attention this event. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in Mumbai. Um, we discussed a couple of weeks ago, we had a pre-discussion with the panelists, and we started thinking about IP strategy. And what exactly does it mean, IP strategy? And I attended a think tank event uh, several months ago, and that think tank event was comprised of individuals both that were um, corporate counsel, uh, academics, uh, outside counsel, and students. And more or less the conclusion that we came up to in terms of uh, what is IP strategy is that it really depends upon the uh, eye of the beholder. And I think of uh, an ancient uh, fable, um, and I know that uh, uh, Madame Partup was uh, rather interested in uh, discussing Confucius, uh, stories of Confucianism. Uh, this story is related to the um, three blind men in a village. Um, and these three blind men, no one in the village had ever seen an elephant. And they brought the elephant into the village. And one blind man came and grabbed the, the tusk and said, oh, this is like a piece of wood. And feel how sharp it is. Someone's obviously worked on it. And another blind man grabbed the leg and said, no, this is a pillar. Uh, can you see how strong it is? And another blind man situated at the rear of the elephant says, you guys, this, this elephant stinks. I don't know what you're talking about. It has no use at all. It's awful. Um, and then a, a village leader came, and they started arguing amongst one of themselves, disagreeing with what exactly the elephant was. And the village leader, who was very wise, uh, came and said, you're, you're all correct. Uh, it's just you're looking at different aspects of it. And so what I hope today is that we have our learned panelists here can help us understand what it is to be the elephant. Let's identify what the elephant is in the room and let's try to tease out some aspects of that and learn. And the, the goal of this panel uh, is to have an interactive discussion. We're very much interested uh, not only hearing about what the panelists have to say, but also what the audience has to say and any questions that you might have with respect to IP strategy. So, you know, I would like to turn now to Mark and Douglas and get their views on not only um, harvesting, and I, I, I like that word because the idea of the harvest is you go out into the field and collect some good to be used. Um, but Mark, uh, Douglas, if you could provide us with your insight and also as a follow-on to that, consider how you would go about aligning and the difficulty associated with aligning a corporate strategy with an IP strategy, or your IP strategy with the corporate strategy. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you all for having me here, first of all. I wanted to say that. I'm delighted to be here, and uh, standard disclaimer applies for me as well. These <laughs> things that I say are my opinion, and they don't reflect uh, the position of my company, past or present. Um, Harvesting IP, uh, it, it is uh, a, good, a good term for the idea, I think. Um, and how the, the companies that I've worked in and in, in, in the years that I've been practicing, um, you know, it's changed somewhat. There was a time when it seemed like uh, quantity uh, was the, the number one thing over quality. So just come forth with all your patent ideas. We'll file as many as we can. We'll increase our portfolio as much as we can. Um, but then the landscape changed. The, the risks out there have changed from strictly uh, dealing with your competitors uh, and, and, and amassing patents in your portfolio to sort of keep the patent peace uh, amongst your, uh, your uh, 
operating company competitors to the the threats of uh, patent assertion entities and trolls and entities that don't make any products so we've had to uh, have a smarter strategy about how we develop and harvest our IP and we can't any longer simply say we'll take all idea uh, all ideas that are given and file everything. So how does a, a company, an operating company, um, you know, get smart about that? In my case, uh, what we do, uh, and we're a large uh, publicly traded operating company, uh, what we like to do is, uh, it, it really goes down to two key things. Number one, an alignment with the business plan. You know, what what is, what is the what are the goals of the business, um, and number two, uh, working with the right people, right? So, um, in 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 my case, the business is broken up into multiple units, uh, based on our different product lines. From each one of those business units, I will try to identify the right people, the experts, the technical experts, those people who have the most experience, the most expertise, who know the most about the, the product development plans within those particular business units. And I assemble a committee of those individuals. So uh, all new invention disclosure ideas are, come to the committee. And the people in the committee um, having all that expertise and experience uh, are we feel best suited to evaluate whether this idea that has been presented uh, is one that uh, represents value uh, for the company and uh, and so we, we hear it and then we, we vote on it and we use a set of uh, criteria to decide uh, you know what constitutes that value um, for example we would ask does this idea cover our current products does this idea cover future products? Um, how easy is it to design around this idea? Um, you know, how easy would it be to identify infringers if we had a, a patent protection over this idea? Um, so we, we go down a list of, of, of questions. We also ask, in some cases, an idea may be better suited as a trade secret rather than a patent depending on the nature of the idea. So once we decide that we want to move forward and apply for a patent, we'll do that. Then we have to decide where, in what jurisdictions do we want this protection. Um, it's become very expensive to file in, you know, all over the world. Uh, so we have to be careful and thoughtful about where are those markets that we want to have this protection, where are our competitors situated, where do we want to sell the products, um, where can we achieve uh, reasonable enforcement, enforcement uh, uh, with our, our IP. Uh, so we try to be thoughtful uh, in all of those aspects and in, 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 in guiding our IP strategy mm -hmm. and deciding on how we can achieve the quality uh, as opposed to uh, just the, the quantity that, uh, that we used to do. So. Douglas? Um, I, I think if we're going to be talking about the management uh, of IP and strategy related to IP, there's two important points I'd like to make. Um, one is before we even start on that, we have to do two things. We have to um, protect our IP and that of our clients, and we have to be able to measure it. I did have some slides. Let's just see if they're available. Doesn't matter. We can continue without them. Oh, oh they're coming up here. <coughs> Confucius said that a picture is a thousand words. Um, I know he was quoted earlier, so once again. Um, I just want to give you some basic measurements. Um, there's not a lot of metrics for our industry. And by the way, we should start calling it an industry. Um, as the first slide shows, 
when you look at organizational value, 78% of it is represented by its intellectual assets. So we collectively as a group are managing by far the largest asset class of any asset class. This includes financial assets, physical assets. What we're managing is the most important part of any enterprise. Um, however, having said that, um, it's interesting that an economist study of how many companies actually have a formal system for managing their intellectual assets, um, less than 5% of them said they did. So that poses the question, how well do we do then without managing our intellectual assets? Well, it's difficult to get an answer to that because there are so few metrics in our industry. Um, but I can give you a few that I managed to cull from various places. First of all, in terms of the number, the percentage of these intellectual assets that ever get licensed. It's between 1% and 2%, and that's actually several different studies, one in academia, one in corporate America, and another one in government. Um, but whichever sector you look at, still about the same. Only 1% or 2% are getting licensed and utilized. Oh, let me just go back to that slide because there's a couple other points there. Um, second point, we, uh, we're also supposed to identify, report um, all of our intellectual assets on our balance sheet. Less than 6% of those are being reported now, which is kind of surprising because if we were reporting more, it would make our balance sheets look a lot better. Um, then the statistic that really is worrying and should worry all of us in this room is that related to theft. It's about 4%. There was a White House study that said $1 trillion is being stolen from just U.S. businesses every year. And when you think about that, that's about twice as much as actually is getting licensed. So this is a really important problem. Um, I've got several slides on it, and I'm going to skip over them very quickly. I just want to make the point that um, there are very sophisticated, I, I refer you to a Mandiant report, which describes um, the efforts of one particular state sponsor of um, cyber theft, where they have 45,000 trained operators well-resourced, broadband access to the internet, fast, powerful computers, trained just to hack in to any particular computer system they want to get into. And initially, there's a shopping list. These are the technologies that seem to be interesting. We'd like to look at them. And if they're not able to get into the company, the next person they go to is their IP lawyer because all the information is there as well. So you have a real responsibility to your clients to make sure the IP is protected. And don't think just because you're a small company, you're immune. The attacks are happening across the spectrum, from the very large to the very small. And most people don't even know they've been attacked. The US government last month, you know, the largest cybercrime in the history of the world, 12 and a half million records that every federal employee, past, present, and future, um, was stolen, along with a 127-page form of all their personal information, um, and their fingerprints, and their polygraph results. And it was a year and a half before the government even realized they'd been attacked. So this is an important issue. Now, the, I will, I'll be brief. There's two quick solutions to this. Um, we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. Um, one is related to, I'm just skipping through these very quickly. One is related to a form of encryption that is coming out now that we've, will change the playing field. Um, before with encryption, it was useful, but then when you want to do anything with the data, you have to decrypt it again, which means you have to give the data center operator or your internal ID department the private key. Now there's a kind of encryption when you can encrypt everything and keep it encrypted and still operate on it, search through it, get statistics out of it without having to decrypt it again. So it stays encrypted. That's one tool. The other tool is something called SDP. I'm just going to go through all these slides very quickly. Um, S basically, there's three kind of things you want to protect from. 
One is your IP when it's sitting there on a server somewhere. The second is when it's moving and being accessed. And the third is from employees, because that's another major source of IP loss. And there's a tool that addresses each of these. It is possible to do, and it's not that expensive to do. However, if you're a very small company, just don't leave anything on a computer that's connected to the internet. If you've got something secure and you're a very small company, just put it on a thumb drive and leave it there. Just access it when you need to. So that's one point that I do want to leave you with. You cannot be complacent about the security of your IP. Second point is, um, so I'm going through this slide very quickly too, okay. Yeah, this is about behavior. The, the second is we need a comprehensive system for managing our intellectual assets. We, we have these things called ERPs, which large enterprises use for managing, um, managing the organization. Um, SAP is a very popular one. It came from a tool that managed the physical assets. PeopleSoft came from a tool that managed the human assets. Um, Oracle came from a tool that managed the financial assets. But when it comes to the most important asset class of all, our intellectual assets, there's nothing. And that's um, one of the things I think we need to address and have been looking at. Um, I'm going to skip these and just in deference to um, a comment Praveen Anand made earlier on about we have to celebrate um, our innovation, our inventors. I did two slides that do just that, except we don't seem to be able to get there. Okay, that, that was a, comp this, this is a tool that we've been working on that manages all aspects of innovation in the organization, both protecting it, capturing it, harvesting it was the term used earlier, um, getting metrics on it, measuring what's happening, making decisions, which ones do we advance and invest in, which ones do we um, out-license, um, and also how do we manage the, one of the biggest problems, how do we market and joint venture and collaborate on something that's very secret for most of its life cycle, um, something that we can talk about if there's time later on. Um, but I just wanted to bring up these two slides quickly. Um, Praveen said, let's celebrate invention and inventors. This is a quick homage to inventors, most of whom we forget about. They're at the top of the value chain. It's what our whole industry depends upon, and we often forget about the inventors. So I just thought I'd bring up this slide. And what's missing from this one? These are all the Western ones. There's also all the ones from the East who often invented it a century or so earlier in the first place. So, so that's all my comments. Great, thank you.